opening speaker is someone I've known for a long time, someone who is uh, from Chennai, uh, and uh, I used AI to create his biography. So I hope he doesn't mind, because I went this morning to chat GP and said, I'm going to int introduce Umesh. What should I talk about him? So it says, Umesh Such, they've co-founded Unifor in 2008. I hope this is correct. Uh, he will to revolutionize human-machine interaction through voice technology. Starting in India, Unifor initially focused on developing voice-based solutions for rural areas, enabling farmers and low literate populations to access information in their local languages. Under Sachdev's leadership, the company pivoted to enterprise applications using AI and machine learning to enhance customer service experiences by analyzing and automating conversations. This shift positioned Unifor as a global leader in conversational AI, attracting major investments and partnerships. Such Dave's journey is marked by persistence, innovation, and a commitment to making technology accessible to all. I hope this was an accurate introduction, Umesh. Please come on up, Umesh Such Dave. This was wonderful. I was very nervous what Chad GPD was going to say about me. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me, MR and everyone at Indiaspora. Great to be with you all today. Uh, and I'm very excited to be kicking off the day today where what promises to be very engaging conversations about the future of our world with AI, how it's changing and what it's going to look like. And you know, once I was invited, as I was thinking about how do I gather my thoughts? What should I talk about from what I'm seeing happen in the industry, et cetera? It was very fascinating. I started to reflect how just in a very short period of time, almost everything that we do from using the internet, searching for information, has evolved. Even so, today, when I'm done here, I don't have to go to the parking lot to my car. I can summon it, and the car finds me somehow and shows up in front of me. The pace of change with AI that we are living through is unprecedented. And we have never seen something move as fast as this technology is moving. And we don't have to look too far behind in history to see where did we come from, how did this happen. I think just the description I'm going to pick up from what MR used ChatGPT for, my own company. 16 years ago when we started a conversational AI business in a lab inside of IIT Madras. I remember back then to get a single English word, let alone Indian languages, recognized by an AI model for speech-to-text would take us months to perfect. Because at that point, we were not only teaching the machine the word, we are teaching it phonemes and phonetics and the sound that the word makes, et cetera. And look where we've come just in a short period of time. 16 years is not that long a time from where I started my company to what today's multimodal LLMs are capable of doing. So today, my company, Unifor, services some of the biggest enterprise in the world. We drive digital transformation for them in many different areas using AI. And we do it using two layers. The first layer is what we call the prepackaged AI agents. Areas like call centers, HR, marketing, sales are all getting automated, all getting assisted with AI. And the second, which we'll talk about today, is for some of the larger enterprises who want to do it yourself, who want to fine tune their model, who want to leverage the power of their data, they're able to do what we call the AI engine role. They're able to take their data, put it through some systems, and start to transform these LLMs for their businesses. And so what's my main message to everyone in the audience today as we open this discussion? My main message is that the AI-led innovation all around us is rapidly transforming the world we live in, but also our place in it. And I want to pick four key themes today to bring this to life. And if by the time I'm done, I made you a little bit uncomfortable about the future, but at the same time, very excited about the future, I feel like I would have done my job really well. And the first of these four themes I want to start talking about is, you know, if I think about the AI as this big building, this big tower that's being erected right now, the first layer is the scaffolding that's holding up this building. And that's the tech stack that's coming about to deliver value through these AI systems. We've all been in enterprise. This audience, I was told, are some of the who's who in the enterprise tech landscape in Silicon Valley. 
And so it wasn't too long back. Today we've come to take for granted the compute that cloud can give us, the storage that cloud can give us. It wasn't too long back that we were still grappling with, we need a new application, therefore we need a new storage, we need a new server, et cetera. And once again, very rapidly with the advent of cloud compute, that architecture shifted. We are living through one such other major shift as we speak. We are going from having multiple different SaaS applications, solving each and every business problem that the enterprise was looking to solve. 50 apps in HR, another 75 for sales, CRM included, and marketing and HR and so on and so forth, to now a simplified architecture that's coming about with AI. And I'm beginning to call it the four-layered cake. And this is the easiest way for my customers to start to understand what this architecture is now looking like. The bottommost layer of this four-layered cake is the data lake. This is where any business, is storing his data. That existed before, that's there still. The role of this data lake has become more prominent. But the layer right above this data lake has become one of the most prominent parts just in the last 12 months of this new architecture. And that's the knowledge lake. So what is this knowledge lake? Think about reaching office every morning, there's like a complex PDF document on your table which has text and tables and images and you have to get to a meeting and you don't have the time to read it, what would you do? You'll call an apprentice. You'll hand over the PDF and say, look, by the time I'm back from my other meeting, tell me what's in this document. Don't summarize it. Just tell me what should I know. And the act of that other person reading the document and coming and saying, here's what was the knowledge inside the document. Here's what you should know. That's called knowledge retrieval. All right. So in the past, when AI wasn't as proliferated as it is today and scaling up really rapidly, it was okay for data scientists to glean into do documents, to glean into listening to older recordings of voice calls, to glean into watching videos and figuring out the knowledge and therefore starting to train AI models to it. The scale and the pace at which this is happening, it's no longer a manual process. And there, therefore, the existence of this new layer, which is knowledge as a service, the technical term that we didn't note up until last year now is prolific, it's called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Those are the new layers, the new technology pieces that are sitting in this layer, where now AI is able to glean knowledge out of all structured and unstructured data. So that's the knowledge lake, all right? So imagine you're in an enterprise, you have so much data sitting in your data, data storage, now you're beginning to extract knowledge from it. The layer right next to it is where these LLMs now come in. And we're beginning to have choices with these LLMs. Open source, proprietary. I don't expect any business to be stuck with just one. Everyone will start to hedge their bets. Now these LLMs, if you're running a large telecom business or a banking business or an insurance business, you want to fine tune them for your purposes. That's going to be the new intellectual property because all of your competitors are going to be using the same LLMs. That's commoditized. What's going to be different is how each of these LLMs get fine-tuned on your company's knowledge. So once again, construct the cake with me. Your data becoming your knowledge, fine-tuning your models. And the most recent innovation that everyone from Salesforce to ServiceNow is beginning to talk about is these AI agents. What are these AI agents? We are now able to train these LLMs not just to answer questions, not just to respond to questions, chat inquiries, but to start to take actions and automate workflows. And so these AI agents are now transforming and replacing the entire SaaS economy that we've come to realize in the last 20 years. That's a major shift, folks, here. Every single SaaS app that either your company has been doing or you are using is likely getting disrupted by an upcoming AI agent that is either prepackaged by a different vendor or your own company or fine tuned within the enterprise. So, what are the implications here? We don't have to look too far. We have all seen press releases from the Swedish company called Klarna. Klarna is a buy now, pay later company. So, why is it significant? It's still a privately held company, it's a large company, very significant 
but why is that important in the AI era? In the last 12 months, Klarna has come about with three press releases. Let's go in sequence. The first press release was that they had 700 people in their customer service organization. They were able to fine tune OpenAI on their data. And now the work of those 700 human beings in contact center is being done by their LLM. They have let go all of the 700 people in their customer service organization. Second press release. They therefore moved from a year ago, $44 million of loss to an adjusted profit margin of positive 66 million just in a year because of the impact of AI. And their latest press release that happened two months ago, which sent shockwaves, is that Klarna announced they had shut down the usage of all of their sales force and workday licenses. Not because they had found competitors in the CRM and HRMS cap category, because yet again the press release said they have fine-tuned OpenAI and created AI agents to do the task that the CRM and HRMS was doing. What was the reaction then? We saw Dreamforce and Mark Benioff saying, we are now agent force. <laughs> this is a major transition that's occurring in every enterprise. And it's happening at a pace that we haven't seen in the past. And so that leads me to talk about if this is a transition, then the single most important person or the department in a company shifts to IT. And that's the second transition I want to talk about. In the last two decades, all of us, including Unifor, in the SaaS economy, had trained our go-to-market machines to go sell to business. Business had all the power. Sell into sales, they have the budget. Sell into marketing, they have a need, they have the budget. Sell into contact centers, you're solving a problem for them, they have the budget. And by the way, avoid technology in the process. IT teams will slow your sales process down, there's a check in the box. IT teams, CIOs got ignored in the process. Well, guess what just happened? I call it the revenge of the CIO now. <laughs> we are seeing it over and over in every company. Starting with the board of directors of these Fortune 500 companies, they are now calling in the CEO and the CIO to say by the next earning cycle, we, have, we better announce our AI strategy, we better announce our architecture, we better announce which partnerships you're gonna do, and by the way, how are we gonna stay compliant to regulation? What does this do? It puts the power back in the control of the CIO. And what is the CIO doing first? Calling business, line of business owners, and saying, you know what, all of those SaaS apps that each one of you have been buying, let's hit the brakes a little bit. Because I've just been given the power to think about a company-wide architecture. I have to be responsible for guardrails. And each time your SaaS app, which comes with machine learning, which comes with another AI model, it may or may not comply with my architecture. How do we know this is happening? Let's go from Klarna, which is a privately held financial services company, to one of the biggest publicly traded financial services company in the world called J.P. Morgan Chase. What has J.P. Morgan Chase come out and said openly, and then press releases? They have yet again worked with OpenAI to release an internal employee bot, where tens of thousands of employees of the bank are now using that in-house chat bot to do reporting and email and communication. We don't have to squint too deep to see what's happening here. That centralized app built by the IT team of JP Morgan is replacing the intranet, which in the past would have been owned by the HR department. And that's just the first thing that's gone into production amongst about 150 pilots that are running inside the bank. So what are the implications yet again? The companies, the vendors who had distribution to the IT, to tech, who knew already had relationships, are likely to succeed. Majority of the SaaS vendors who are ignoring IT all of a sudden find themselves on the wrong side of the budget cycle. And if we con continue down this theme, if we say that, look, this is not an aberration, this is becoming a trend, we're beginning to see this over and over, then I predict that the number of companies in the world who will be capable of doing what Klarna did or JP Morgan did on their own is gonna be less than five. But every single business would be forced either by their shareholders 
or the need for more margins to move in this direction. And that leads me to my third transition, the shift in the knowledge economy. The role of consulting firms, IT integration firms, system integrator firms up until now in the pre-AI era was to take a set of disparate technology solutions and bring them together to deliver a certain business outcome. In the new world of AI, it's these firms who now are building practices of data science, prompt engineering, et cetera, getting them trained on platforms, either companies like Unifor or others out there, creating consulting workflows, transformation workflows, and going to each business and saying, we can help you deliver outcomes like Klarna, like JP Morgan, and others. So I take an example. One of Unifor's partners, a $2 billion company called Connecta out of Spain. Their key clients are in Colombia, France, Spain, Italy. They are now shifting their business from being a pure outsourcing shop in IT with, you know, decent two-digit margins to a very high margin digital transformation business in AI. They're going to over 500 clients and saying, we ran your processes, we know your data, we know your domain, we are best positioned to now start to replace your software and SaaS solutions with AI agents and deliver EBITDA gains. But it's a head scratcher. How are these EBITDA gains happening? Every single client of mine has, in the last two years, dramatically stepped up their AI investment, without exception. I have never been in a selling cycle for the last 20 years, where of course I have to sell my company, who am I, what do I do? but I don't have to worry about where's the budget. Anything to do with this AI economy is almost getting infinite budgets from these companies. Then I look at these companies as balance sheets as they announce it every quarter, and I'm not seeing their overall expenditure go up. So solve this math with me. They're spending a whole lot more in AI, but at an aggregate, they're not spending more than they used to. Where is that money coming from? It's coming from the next transition that I'm going to talk about. It's a dramatic shift in headcount in each of these companies. And that brings me to the impact AI is going to have on jobs and therefore society at large. In the pre-AI era, we've, we've been through these cycles over and over. In the pre-AI era, automation, industrialization has shown us the impact on laborious jobs, blue collar jobs. Over the last five decades, we've been witness to more such revolutions than we can remember. For the first time in the AI revolution, white collar jobs, knowledge work, healthcare, legal, of course software, financial services, underwriting, these are the jobs that are beginning to get impacted. And this is a major transition that we're beginning to see, not just in industries, what does it mean for societies? There is a dire need to start to reskill workforces around the world, because guess what? AI businesses are gonna be net hirers. They're gonna be recruiting in large numbers. But this, the workforce in the world, in every country, is not ready for that. So there is an imbalance already. Once again, how do I know this to be true? One of my biggest clients, a very large telecom company in North America, we work very closely with them. The CIO calls their AI strategy the idiot savant strategy. The idiot savant strategy. So I asked him a year ago, what is this idiot savant strategy? And he said to me, Omesh, we are not gonna take a big LLM and train it on all our data, such that that LLM becomes the brain of the company. We have tried that, it's too expensive, that's not the architecture we wanna go for. We will use those LLMs, probably smaller models, and train them on narrow domains, but give them very deep knowledge. So I said, give me an example. He said, okay. The number one issue of customer care in a telecom company, it's billing. This company gets 350 million calls in their call centers every month, okay? 70 million of them are about one topic, what's in my bill? Why? Because telecom bills are, now, are not meant for human eyesight. 
They are not like a bank statement which go debit, credit, total, got it. Nobody in this room can ever read a telecom bill because it just is unreadable. And therefore, 70 million calls a month to this company is what's in my bill. It takes a call center representative approximately 18 minutes to answer that question. And out of 30,000 people in call centers in this company, it's a very large company, 5,000 of them are exclusively answering the billing question. But that's not all. These 5,000 people in the call center have 5,000 co-pilot licenses, have 5,000 analytics software, predictive models running to support them giving this answer. Okay, so the first small language model out of the idiot savant strategy that the CIO wanted to train was a billing SLM. And his strategy was very simple to understand. Take 350 million bills that get generated every month, multiplied by the last six months of bills, feed it to the LLM through the four-layered cake, correspondingly feed it the accounting data, the product data, the promotion data, everything that went in to generating those bills. So now this SLM knows everything about how does this company generate a bill. But let's not stop there. Let's now give it an agentic workflow. So the rules that this company has around billing. Yes, I charge you 10 bucks extra because you roamed internationally, but since you call me and you're a loyal customer, I will reverse that bill. You can now train the agentic workflow in the LLM. Okay, what's the implication? This SLM goes into production. Every customer who walks into the branch, goes to the website, calls the call center about a billing question now is directly interfacing either through chat or voice to the billing SLM. And the billing SLM is beginning to handle over 90% of billing related interactions. How many people were answering these calls? 5,000. How many co-pilot licenses were there? 5,000. How many analytic softwares were running? Several. No longer needed. Next SLM, paralegal. Over 1,000 paralegals in this firm are redlining contracts every day. They are training a paralegal SLM. And this CI is very ambitious. The biggest headcount in the networking a telecom company is network knock. The people who handle our towers and networks such that our cell phones have those bars. They are now training a network SLM, which will automate majority of the task of managing a knock and making decisions. Dramatic implications on headcount. Dramatic free cash flow increase for the company. Dramatic EBITDA increase for the company. But this is coming. So as I think through where are we headed, we could not have predicted this two years ago when ChatGPT came about. But just in that period, we are seeing leaders pushing really hard in one direction. And we're beginning to see one press release every two or three months start to talk about it. We are not too far from such press releases happen every hour of the day across every company. Now, as I think through this transition, I predict the next two to three years will be a moment of transition. We will coexist. It's not like all of us are shutting down our Salesforce licenses tonight because we've all figured this out. So you're gonna see a coexistence of the legacy and the new. We're gonna see the same companies that sold us the older software beginning to push us in the new direction. So the next two to three years will be confusing, they'll be messy, but make no mistake, we're headed in one direction. And once we're on the other side, I predict a couple of big themes for us to consider as a group, as a society, as citizens of the world. The first, I call it the age of abundance. Every single company in 1998, 99 that failed to become dot-com isn't around today. And so every single company that fails to become an AI company from here on, we will not know about them two to three years from now. And the ones who do it will be reporting 30 to 40% increase in free cash flow, dramatic increase in EBITDA margin, doing way more with way less. And we are headed in that world of age of abundance. What does this also mean? The vendor leaderboard. Today it's hard to see it, just like it was in hard to see in 98. 
how the key leaders like IBM and Cisco and Oracle won't be the ones taking all the value of internet. That didn't happen. Because out of that period came about Salesforce and ServiceNow and Meta and Google. And so we're at that period where it's hard to see we're in the infrastructure build out phase. Starting with GPUs to data centers to even LLMs, we are in the infrastructure build out phase. And it seemed like only the big companies can do this and therefore they're gonna capture all the value. Well, let's be students of history. We're in the Computer History Museum. Majority of the value of a major tech transition occurs after the infrastructure is built out at the application layer. That layer would look different this time. We might end up calling them agents or something else. But the leaderboard as we think about it is not gonna be the same. And therefore this leads me to the major thing that we all should be thinking deeply about, the shift in society. There is a dire need in an accelerated fashion for governments and administrators and leaders to be thinking about two key themes. One, aggressively let's start to rescale our, our citizens. But second, we are gonna have opportunities for having three day work weeks. We are gonna have opportunities where all of us could get more done with our AI assistants or the Optimus robots that Elon Musk launched yesterday with us doing either higher order jobs or having more time to ourselves. But more significantly, the gap between the haves and the have nots is gonna widen. And I don't just mean this from an economy or a leader or enterprise point of view, it's even individuals. There'll be individuals who will be on the right side of this transition and capture a lot of value and wealth creation for themselves. And unfortunately, there's gonna be a big piece of the population that will find itself in the have nots with lesser jobs and lesser opportunities. And so yet again, for governments to really deeply think about redistribution of wealth models among the economies, to redesign social security in a way that it takes care of the haves and the have nots in this economy. Because it won't just be governments and countries who are in the lead of technology. US for sure is. We have highest number of GPUs, highest number of investment of data science. But it'll be countries who come up with these governance models that will end up leading. And there's no guarantee that US is in the lead there. UAE, which is a big part of Indiaspora's focus, has come about with this council of artificial intelligence. And they're pushing towards thinking through what are these governance norms which will be needed when AI pro proliferates. The EU Act is now the baseline regulation that most countries are beginning to follow. And so the countries that will do this well will end up leading. But the cool thing about AI is that it knows no boundaries. It is not waiting for regulation or policy to occur. It's moving at a speed of light without anyone stopping it or controlling it. And that brings me to this room. Our role in this transition. That the genies out of the bottle is clear, that the direction of travel is clear, and that this evolution is happening at a faster pace than we've ever seen is also clear. But we all in this room are leaders of our industry, are leaders of companies, are leaders of teams, we have the opportunity to shape what happens with this AI. We cannot be passive in this journey. And what is our role here? First, let's think about what are the things we, we can control. Number one, my ask is of this group, continue to bring curiosity. The fact that we are all here today, spending a day of reimagining AI, shows me this is a curious group. We want to learn, we want to be in the know of what's happening. Number two, Let's think about our role in policy making. California recently came very close to passing a regulation, SB 1047, didn't pass. It's our role as citizens, it's our role as leaders of the industry, especially tech, especially Silicon Valley, to stay very close to these regulations. If you see something that could hurt, this is the time to raise our voice because we're living in un imperfect information. And my third ask is constantly let's network. Let's learn from each other. Because there isn't gonna be one company, big or small, that has all the perfect information. So I'm reminded of this famous quote 
by the late British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. And I had to go back in history quite a bit to see what did he say. In 1943, he spoke to the House of Lords in Britain. And the topic he was speaking on was he was proposing the reconstruction of the House of Commons that had then been destroyed during World War II. And in that context, he said, it is us who shape our buildings around us, but thereafter, those buildings shape us. So when it comes to AI, this, this skyscraper or the tower that we are building here, that may or may not be a part of warfare. Maybe it will be, but one thing is for clear. It has the opportunity to shape the future for our next generations. I think about my kids and what kind of life they're gonna have knowing what I know about AI. And so I challenge you all in this room, it is up to us, it is our generation that's gonna shape what AI does or doesn't do for our future generations. And we cannot be passive. So with that, I wanna congratulate for being here on an open today's day and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Amish. Uh, you painted a, an extraordinary picture here, one that's exhilarating and thrilling, and one that's scary, right? So my first question is on the jobs thing, and I'll have the audience jump in as well. So reskilling, mm -hmm. when you're thinking of these people being uh, laid off or uh, re repositioned in companies, especially in contact centers seem like one of the first places where people are being replaced or let go, how would they go about thinking of where their future is going to be and what skills they need to get? Well, that's a great starting point. And one of the things MR told me last week as we were talking about how do we get the best uh, impact from this session, he said, be provocative, right? So I'm gonna answer this in the same way. It is inevitable now that call centers as we know it will not have the same architecture. I'm not the one to predict that they'll go, all go extinct but they'll be dramatically shrunk and they'll have a very different architecture, dramatically assisted or led by AI with human beings in supervisory capacity or support capacity. So what does it all mean for those businesses and those human beings who are working in those companies? In the last six months, I've been on an aggressive road trip. Unifor has one of the highest market share of all BPOs in the world. We, we supported most contact centers as we know them today. I'm going to each of those CEOs and saying, I hope it's clear to you that you have an existential problem. The good news here is almost all of them are vehemently in, in approval. My recipe for renewal of the business, therefore, because ultimately jobs are a factor of those businesses, is I'm, I'm telling them you have a clear asset. Most of your clients who you support today in your call centers, they could be banks, they could be airlines, they could be cruise ship companies, they all want a transition like this, and they have no choice. They're either gonna do it with you or without you. You have been supporting their processes, you know their data, you understand their domain. Your people who receive these calls, they do. Let's quickly reskill these people. They don't have to be data scientists. That's the good news now. AI is becoming easier and easier. It's getting democratized. My 10-year-old daughter plays around with chat GPT and comes out with new experiments every day, which surprises me. It's becoming really simple. Let's take those people in your call centers who understand the business domain, let's train them on these platforms so that they can start to model these new fine-tuned idiot savants for your clients, and you become the service provider in this new world for those clients. So the answer is, I think a lot of us are beginning to see the writing on the wall and what we need to do really rapidly. But like I said, it's up to us leaders. I tell my CEO customers, it has to come from the top. We have to move rapidly. You have to tell your team, you are paranoid. Even if your team thinks, but last quarter we did well, why are you worried? Because this will shift faster than we all think. Uh, questions from the audience? I know there are two or Uh, are you starting to think more in terms of outcome-based pricing and, and, and how are you thinking about this from 
a uniform perspective, not just from your so, constituent class? Great question. Look, I think pricing is a third order problem. I got into this panic existential mode three years ago. Thankfully, being an AI, we had seen starting 2018 when Google wrote the white paper on transformers, we had started to move on LLMs. Having over 1,500 clients today, we have the ear and relationships with most of these CIOs. And we saw how they were beginning to think. And almost three years ago, right around the time Microsoft announced a $10 billion investment in OpenAI, it was very clear to me that my business as I know it is not going to be the same. The technology wasn't shifting for me. I was already on LLMs. But my entire business model was appended. Because prior to that, I was selling contact center or sales or HR automation solutions with my AI platform, and I was selling to business. I saw the power shifting to the CIO. I saw most of my Fortune 500 clients, we don't sell into mid-market. Mid-market is a different recipe. But for the large enterprise, they're going to want to do a lot of this in-house. It's a DIY situation. Why? Because it's sovereignty. They will not let other people touch their data. Even if they have in the past, they're more wiser now. And they will not let somebody else touch their fine-tuned model, because that's the new IP in this new world. And so we use our relationships to say, knowing the direction of travel, we've been your AI partner for the last four, five, six, seven years. We're going to open our platform. The, the same tools that we were using to deliver your agents and apps, we're going to give it to your teams now. So we released new products. We opened up the platform. We became a full end-to-end -end AI platform for them, shift one. And to your point, therefore, these new layers were on a different pricing model. The agents are still priced by the user. And it is a fact, like I said, next two to three years, we are still dramatically increasing the user count on those agents. Because while this is happening in North America, Europe and Asia are still behind. Mid-market and SMB may not do DIY. So there's still a phase of growth for those user-based agents. But our platform layers, knowledge as a service, model as a service, are on a consumption model. Back there. Oh. Go ahead. What fundamental modes exist at this point beyond, I guess, distribution and kind of verticalization uh, from your perspective, being kind of a platform player that's selling to large enterprises? Uh, great question. Um, so look, clearly, I think the world is headed to a point where platformization is occurring. And the power is shifting from point solutions to platforms. So let's talk about who have the ability and the wherewithal to be credible platforms, the hyperscalers. As part of their cloud offerings, we've seen Amazon's Bedrock, Google's Vertex offering, Microsoft's Azure AI offering. They are promising a full platform approach to their clients. We haven't seen it yet, but the announcements out of Dreamforce this year tell me that Salesforce wants to move in the platform direction. And I would predict companies like Databricks, because of the acquisitions they've been doing, are moving in that direction. Unifor is coming from AI apps and agents into a platform domain. There's going to be a handful of these. It won't be a winner take all. There's going to be a handful. What differentiates and what is the opportunity of the more, whether you take the themes that you mentioned, verticalization or distribution, it all comes down to one thing that the vendors and the platforms who understand your business domain, whether you call it I'm verticalized for you or I already had relationships for you, which is why I think BPOs have a very high, they have a big asset here if they decide to use it well. You can take a vanilla horizontal platform coming from a hyperscaler and good luck getting out of pilot mode 18 months from now. Or you can take something that was already designed for your industry with your workflows, with your business process embedded in it, call it a pre-trained SLM here, for a few, if you're an insurance company underwriting, for example, or customer care, for example, if that comes pre-trained in these SLMs, your time to value is shorter. So I think the moat is business domain. The moat is understanding your customer. You could do it by being verticalized for one, or you could, I'm taking a handful, and I have my mode because I come from that industry, I've done other things in that industry, and I'm best suited to deliver time to value. 
Just a couple of questions, so if we could keep it brief. Uh, maybe you can take two questions in one shot. Okay, sure, so sure, sure. Amit no, will go next. First of all, Amar, thank you for organizing this second event. The first at Stanford was incredible, and this has started off very well. Um, and thank you, the whole team. Um, Umesh, great presentation. Really, we hear about a lot of pieces, but you really put it together. My concern is, as we imagine AI, weaponization of AI, a lot of people see business as a war as opposed to a sport. How they will weaponize AI, and the second part is using AI in weapons as we think about shift in the society. What is your view on that? Okay, let's take two together. Yeah, uh, Amit? to upskill their non-technical staff so that there's a heightened AI literacy going beyond just the fundamentals to the role-specific and division-specific responsibilities for HR, legal, et cetera. How, how do you uh, help your CIO clients and other CEOs uh, make that management level upskilling happen? Yeah, so let's take these in reverse because I want to have fun with your question. They're good to see you. Um, on this topic of reskilling, once again, we've been thinking deeply about this subject because, you know, once again, our lives depend on how quickly our customers are able to, to transform their business. And we realized this having an oh shit moment that, you know, even the CIO or CEO is asking me basic questions about Gen AI, let alone their people. How am I going to take them along this journey? So a year and a half ago, we created for the first time, we're a software product company nothing to do with services, we created a consulting shop within our group. Not with a view of diversifying revenue streams, but leading with consulting and helping our clients with, let's educate your people first, let's design your transformation next, and we have the tools to do it. And that led us, that experiment was very good for me because it, it allowed me to see what was happening. And very quickly I realized that my consulting group is all of five people today. 800 people in my company, five doing consulting. The world would need probably 50,000 of such consultants to help each of my clients do this. And so then, in the last year, we aggressively went to the knowledge economy. The Accenture, the EY, the McKenzie striking partnerships and saying, let's work together, because it will take a village to make this happen. And we are, we are the software player. We cannot be the ones educating and consulting, but we need you all. And that, what, that was a shift that I spoke of. In terms of warfare, um, look, if we believe that it's waiting to happen, we're wrong. Uh, we already know companies like Palantir, which are leading the way with AI. The good news is Palantir is a, a US company. But our adversaries have their own versions of this, either owned by the government or private sector in different countries. So the warfare of the future will be heavily driven by AI. And it may be with physical weapons or it may be with cyber. And I know Saket is here, and he's going to talk about his company. We're going to hear some interesting topics. Um, but AI has, we have to believe that AI is already weaponized from a warfare standpoint. I think your first part of the question was weaponizing from a business standpoint. And yes, we have to be super careful. We are already seeing the war with the upcoming election without getting into that topic of free speech versus not. Is the role of AI to prevent filters and allowing 100% free speech? or is the role of AI to put filters so that the content we don't want people to see is not seen. It's a polarizing topic. And those are big societal topics that we must all be debating right now because otherwise it's gonna to be too late and decisions would be made around us. I think we had one last question, go ahead. Sure, well, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for both of you, wonderful, wonderful session. So Umesh, one question. Um, so it's clear that if you're a large company, and I, I, let's just go to contact center, it's easy to understand. There's a lot of data, you can train it, you can start. If you're a, either a small company or just starting, and there is complete lack of data, or you, had, you, know, you have 100 records so far, you can't train the system, uh, but you have to take something from outside. How do you suggest this, these departments that are starting up in new world, where they should use a SLM to start, how does that work in, in your view? So, great question, I think, to conclude our session this morning. Um, 
Let's start with busting a myth. I live all day long with large companies. That's my core business. A couple of months ago, I happened to be in Germany with, let's just call it, one of the world's top two insurance players. Way in the trillions of assets under management. And I was making a board presentation, and their chief data officer interrupted me on one of these slides and said, but I have a question. We don't have enough data. One of the top two insurers in the world, trillions of assets under management, and he was saying he doesn't have data. And you're saying it's a small company problem. He wasn't wrong, because we've seen this for the last 16 years. We go in, we sign contracts, we sell the dream of AI, we say, kumbaya, let's do a kickoff, please give us your data. Where is it? And the reason for that is, look, I consider Tesla an AI native company. Much like cloud native, we are beginning to find AI native. Tesla, for the last decade or more, has had this vision of someday I'm going to get to a robot taxi. So therefore, they have been assembling their data systematically towards training their models. An insurance company, a bank, a, a telecom company has not been doing that. And so the newer techniques, which apply both to them and smaller firms, is now you have tools to generate synthetic data. So whatever small amount of clean data you have, you are able to now replicate it get Gen AI to generate data and increase the training sets and so on and so forth. That's strategy one. But more importantly, when I meet a customer who's just at the beginning of this AI journey, I say, don't even worry about fine tuning your models. Your step one, because very quickly you need to show ROI. Your CFO and board is gonna ask you, why are we wasting money on AI very quickly? And so let's start you with prepackaged agents. Call centers, you have 500 people in the call center. Let's get it down to 450. We can do that in three months now. That will allow you bigger budgets, bigger ambitions to do other things. Umesh, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. You're kicking us off today. Thank you.